Hey everyone, tickets are on sale now for the 39th Annual National Homebrewers Conference, also known as HomebrewCon. Join your homebrewing comrades this June 15th through 17th in Minneapolis, the City of Lakes, for three unforgettable days of learning, camaraderie, and delicious beer. Space is limited, so be sure to register now at homebrewcon.org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, March 9th, 2017. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, home brewer Scott Kaway joins us to talk about his experience with kettle fermentation, using the same vessel to boil and ferment. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And if you buy any of our DVD combos, you get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener. And don't forget to get a copy of our Brewer's Logbook. You can use it to log and track up to 50 batches of beer. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing, all one word. We also have the uh, Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon shopping, think of us first. Go to basicbrewing.com, and uh, on the right-hand side of the page there, you'll see the little Amazon ad. Click on that. Uh, it'll take you back to Amazon where you can shop to your heart's content. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you the show, and we greatly appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site as well. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes, our Android app on Amazon.com, we have a Windows Phone app. We're on the BlackBerry Podcast Directory. We're on the Stitcher app. We're on Google Play Music. We're in the iHeartRadio app. We're just in the air. You can just <laughs> listen closely, and you can hear the show. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our virtual guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support, and thanks to everybody who's done so already. Uh, I spent the morning yesterday with uh, Casey Latelier, Longtime friend of the podcast and, and longtime friend of me, I, I hope I can say, for what turned out to be a, a two-part interview. Uh, you may remember, if you're a fan of uh, going through the archives, Casey, uh, otherwise known as Casey from Asylum Springs, was uh, first on the show in December of 2005 as he and his friends Brian and Jason uh, brewed a beer based on mystery ingredients that they and I brought uh, they called it a blind mice brew. Now, I've had Casey on the show a couple times more over the years, and he's brewing professionally now at West Mountain in Fayetteville, Arkansas, on his way to opening his own brewery, Ivory Bill Brewing in Salem Springs, and I'm very excited about that. Uh, yesterday morning, uh, Casey shared 10 samples of beers that he's been brewing at West Mountain and also shared lots of tips and information uh, and so I decided to split our conversation into two parts uh, that I'll play over the next two weeks. And I hope you'll enjoy that as much as I did. And uh, speaking of the next two weeks, a uh, week after next, my family and I are going to be spending spring break in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, we'll be staying a couple of days in Victoria and then driving up to Vancouver. And uh, last show, I asked for suggestions about where to go beer-wise and I've gotten a lot of good information uh, from folks, and I appreciate your taking time to write in. Uh, Granville Island Brewing in Vancouver received the most attention. Uh, almost everybody said to go there. Uh, apparently, I looked on their website. Apparently, the the they say they're the first craft brewer in uh, in Canada. So they started in uh, 1984. So I'm going to try to try to drop by there. Um, I I don't want to turn this va this vacation with the family into a work thing. Uh, so I don't want to get too too distracted from from family time, but I do hope to get uh, uh, some of the uh, good beer places in. And uh, thanks to everybody who again who wrote in. And uh, the drinking age is 19 in uh, British Columbia, and uh, my son will be 20. So uh, kind of you know I kind of I feel feel good about you know buying uh, my my son's first legal beers but you know there's a, there's a note of caution as well because uh, we all know that uh, that there's a downside to you know a, a consumption of alcohol and so I'm hoping that uh, that we'll be able to kind of clue him in on the responsible and safe ways of uh, enjoying 
uh, our favorite beverage. I posted an episode of a Basic Brewing Video on Monday. Uh, Steve shared his smoked ESB in that show. Uh, in that beer, he used a pound of beechwood smoked malt to add a bit of, uh, you know, sort of campfire to a traditional ESB, or at least his take on a traditional ESB. It is really a delicious beer. The smoke is not overpowering, and it is nicely balanced uh, by the rest of the beer. Um, I don't think I've had beechwood smoked malt before. Uh, other smoked malts like alderwood, you know, that reminds me of smoked salmon uh, or, you know, like cherry smoked uh, uh, malt sm smells a lot like bacon. Uh, but this beechwood stuff is, is a lot more neutral to me. Um, so it's very, very tasty beer. So check that episode out. It's on the feed and on uh, the YouTubes and stuff like that. And then last night, Steve came over to uh, record a tasting for a future audio episode, and he, he shared a hopped ginger sizer uh, that he made in his store, Steve's Brew Shop in Fayetteville. Very nice. He is really hitting on all cylinders uh, on that. Speaking of uh, nice and brew shops, let's hear from our sponsors, Desiree and Dave of High Gravity in Tulsa. It's been a while since I've talked about the specifics of their turnkey brew-in-a-bag electric brewing systems. Uh, Steve and I each have one. I have the bigger one. It's got 15 and a half gallons total capacity. That's if you fill the, the kettle all the way to the top. And it runs on 240 volts. Steve has 11 gallons total capacity and 120 volts. Uh, I have to unplug my clothes dryer to use mine, but... Uh, <laughs> But Dave uh, gave me a long enough cable so that I can brew out on the patio outside or in the kitchen. So Steve's can be plugged into any household outlet. Um, mine has 4,500 watts, and Steve's has 2,250 2, watts. All high-gravity systems come with the really cool Werthog electric brewery controllers, uh, which have mash and boil modes, Precision power control and timers, if you if you need timers, uh, that can either stop uh, the uh, electric functions or they can just beep at you and let you know that the things are done or up to temperature. Um, I just I love electric brewing. Uh, brewing brewing with propane. Brew, brewing with propane was always a pain. Propane puts the pain in brewing. I have to work on that. May <laughs> <laughs> you know, making sure I had enough fuel, uh, not being able to brew if it was windy outside, uh, not having control over my mash temperature. You know, brewing electric with a Warthog controller especially is a ton of fun. At HighGravityBrew.com, you can see all the turnkey systems along with uh, standalone work Warthog controllers uh, to fit many brewing needs. And, uh, and if you shop at HighGravityBrew.com, You'll be supporting a family-owned and run business. So go check them out at highgravitybrew.com. Okay, way back in the archives, uh, you'll find a show where Scott Kuway gave us the basics of roasting our own coffee beans. And it's something that I do all the time now, and I enjoy it quite a bit. And you can, you know, it's natural to pair coffee uh, either in beers or with beers. Uh, so it's a natural extension of the hobby. Uh, since then, Scott has moved from San Francisco to Detroit and has expanded his home brewery. And uh, he's been playing with the technique of fermenting in his brew kettle. Well, Scott Kuway, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Welcome, Jim. Or welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Good to be here. You're rusty. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I looked at in the uh, on the RSS feed, and I noticed that uh, we talked about coffee in August of 2008, which is co so, going on going on nine years ago. So, so we keep in touch regularly. <laughs> <laughs> actually, we do. We email a bunch. But. Yeah, we actually do keep in touch. Um, yeah, and so I, you got me uh, uh, into uh, coffee roasting, uh, you know, more earnestly. I, I eventually I burned out my old hot air popcorn popper, 
I, mm-hmm. tr- I tried to do a dark, you know, French roast, and it just got too hot and burned out some sort of resistor or something in the thing. And so yeah. I, I invested in a fresh roast SR500 uh, coffee roaster, um, which I like quite a bit. It's got a, The thing that I don't like about it is it's got a timer. And, uh, yeah. and I don't know why you would need a timer or use a timer when you're roasting coffee because it's all about the senses. It's all about looking and smelling and hearing and, and you know, it depends on right. – I do it outside, so it depends on what the ambient temperature is outside. And so I don't know how you could just use a timer reliably when you're I roasting coffee. I believe the timer is there to pass consumer safety issues oh. so, you, so you don't – because it gets so hot, it would set everything on fire. I and see. the beans stay in. See, we're with like a with a popcorn popper, pretty much it all leaves into the bowl. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot to set on fire, but the beans will stay in there, and they will set on fire. I, <laughs> <laughs> I tried to finish a batch once and with that same kind of popper. It just it wouldn't get dark, and I thought, oh well, I I put it in the microwave for a very short amount of time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ash does not taste that good. I'm telling you. <laughs> um, what you burned out was the uh, the thermal fuse. Mm. I burned that out of mine too, so I opened it up and <laughs> bypassed it. <laughs> well, I, I I opened it up and I was gonna I was gonna fiddle with it, and then I thought, you know what this this popcorn popper it does okay at making at uh, roasting coffee beans, but I want something with more control, and you know I want to do it right, and so. I invested in this little uh, uh, coffee roaster, and there's a uh, local um, coffee place here in town. They roast their own beans, and they've got a ton of different kinds of uh, of coffee beans uh, that they'll sell me, you know, a pound or two at a time. And so I like to play with the different kinds of coffee and the different roasting uh, levels and things like that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I. I... I buy whatever sort of hits my fancy from Sweet Maria's, which is where I see there's, I guess I could probably get some local now. There are a lot of coffee roasters. Since since we've talked, I moved to Detroit, which you know, but the listeners don't. Yeah. Um, from San Francisco. <laughs> and when I, when I moved here, there was not like a lot of restaurants or anything. Um, well, there was, yeah, a lot, of, not a lot of the stuff we were used to being able to walk to. So uh, coffee roasting was important, and uh, beer making was – there was a good beer around here at that point, six years ago. Right now, there is no homebrew store inside Detroit. Mm. When I go out, there's supposedly – this guy gets his act together, um, or money, more likely. Uh, we live in an area that, that sort of held it together in Detroit. Detroit – and the news is looks like it's totally devastated or was now it's all news about restaurants, but go back a few years and it's all about destroyed buildings. But the reality was that pockets in Detroit were very intact and everything in between was trashed. Mm. And where we ended up moving is a pocket that had at worst, I think it had a 30% vacancy rate in the neighborhood, Mm. um, which was, well, well uh, below what the average in the city. The city went from two million to six hundred thousand. So mm. <laughs> there was a lot of empty buildings. Um, but the the neighborhood right next to us has really taken off. The, the, the ours is a historic district. You can't put businesses in it. So you know the houses are basically all sold now. But you won't get any businesses. But the next one over is not. And so there's now walking distance to restaurants uh, there's a big bar uh place and then down the street from that when it finishes there's going to be a brew pub and a homebrew store there's a grain place i buy sack uh sacks of grain in bulk for base malts um and it's a <laughs> it's a uh, uh what do you call it janitor janitorial supply company and <laughs> The owner's son is into home brewing, so they have a little sideline where he he likes a lot. Of, he buys a lot of grain and he sells grain, and they sell it in like, I think you can get ten pounds as the smallest amount, but mostly it's sacks, 
and a few other things just to, you know, it's not a homebrew store, mm-hmm. um, but you can get grain really affordably. And then there's two homebrew stores that are in the suburbs that I can travel off to when I need other things. Now, and Amazon is your friend. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, you, you know, thinking about Detroit, the D- Detroit area, uh, you know, one might think about Flint and their problems with water. Are you involved in that at all? How's your water? Um, our water's fine. Uh, I run everything through a filter. People were like, eh, nah, but our water main is lead. I mean, the main feed to the house is lead, as is, I think, a lot of the city. Um, so all of our drinking water is filtered, all of our cooking water is filtered, and all of my brewing water is filtered. But the problem with Flint was they switched off of Detroit water. Mm. <laughs> they had been getting Detroit water, and then they went off their river water, which was really acidic, and then they didn't treat it. If you're going to have lead pipes, you treat it with this calcium stuff that builds up. So the inside of the pipes basically is a calcium tube. Mm-hmm. So unless you move the pipes, you really have very little lead content coming in. Um, the other place it can build up is in your hot water tank because the lead will precipitate out. So over time, your hot water tank can actually get a much higher level of lead. But since we got this house, uh, hadn't been winterized, everything that deals with water was blown to pieces, um, including the heating system. We had to replace everything anyway, so we went a on-demand water heater, so there is no water tank. So, mm. um, Yeah, so the water uh, the water check stuff is actually quite clean in Detroit, and it's a nice middle. It's not too minerally, and it's not too acidic, so you can use it for most things without doing too much. I add minerals for IPAs, but um, you can probably brew just about anything and be okay. Excellent. So... What did what is your uh, system like? I mean, what did when you moved from San Francisco to uh, to Detroit? Did you get to add on stuff? Did you get to grow your gear? One of my gifts to myself was I went from bottling to kegging, and I went from extract to all grain. So I expanded quite a bit when I got here, uh, partially because this is a much bigger place, and I have I have a brewery downstairs, and in San Francisco I had a little hole in the corner where I could. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so it, and it's continued to expand. So right now I, I doing all grain here. I was doing it on the back porch, but the winter it's frozen outside. And, and so I ended up rigging up big exhaust fan and, um, setting aside a hunk of the basement. Uh, and I have a, like, uh, uh, monoxide alarm up and stuff <laughs> and and eventually when i we get the remains of the old destroyed boiler out of there um i will move the humbrew setup over to there use the chimney for the flue for the exhaust and switch it all to natural gas which oh. should be better yeah i already have the big burners for that but uh and i've got 220 if i wanted to go electric which i might do for the hot liquor tank just because it's uh, right now I have one of those uh, sous vide immersion circulators mm-hmm. and I tend to use that to start up uh, strike water because you you know you type in a number and you walk away and you do whatever you want to do and you know it's not going to boil away and get too hot and it's a little slow but um, so that I might switch over to electric because I do have the power sitting there well I know some folks uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I know, and, and and people probably heard the ad before we started talking. So uh, they're probably the people I will be talking to, because um, as much as I do a lot of do-it-yourself stuff, I don't know. Working with two twenty around liquid, yeah, I think maybe I want someone who actually has done it before. <laughs> I was like, ah, no monoxide, but I electrocuted myself. <laughs> um, yeah, there's... So right now I've got two burners and three pots on a big 
rack kind of thing so that I can uh, heat up the strike wire, go to two different mash tons. So I, have, I have a five gallon and a 10 gallon. It, so what we were going to talk about, though, is this ferment in the kettle, right? Right. Yeah. We're, I just wanted to kind of bring bring people up to speed and get some background on you, you know, as, as, to, as to far as, you know, what kind of beers you brew and what your brewing setup is like. Uh, and and so... Well, I, I brew... I, I, the biggest boon and the best advice I give to people is find some events that you can brew for and because volume te- is a phenomenally good teacher. <laughs> um, so there's a big home and garden tour here and every summer it's a big money maker for the homeowners association and stuff. And they used to have really lousy, like Miller, I shouldn't name a name, I guess, but <laughs> um, commercial big box light beer. And it was like, you know, it was actually hurting because people volunteered their, the, the meal party thing for the workers afterwards is part of their pay. And, so I was like, oh, God, no one would go to the after party because it was like kind of miserable. So someone talked me into brewing stuff for it. And uh, so I started doing that and I've been roped into it ever since. But the good part is, you know, it's I brew 20 gallons for that event, which you can donate legally. <laughs> um, anyway, but you can do events like that for nonprofit kind of thingamajiggers. You can you can brew a lot more than you would drink. If I had to drink all the stuff that I brewed, I'd be in rehab. Um, <laughs> so it helps to have neighbors who like to drink it too. Experience um, experience is a good teacher. Yeah. Yeah. It really helped a lot. Uh, brewing a lot. I mean, I did uh, almost 200 gallons a couple of years ago Wow! for the year. And and I was doing, you know, like 150 to 200 gallons, like three years in a row. And that made a huge improvement. <laughs> I mean, people liked it before. Uh, and I liked it. I never I had very few batches I didn't like, but it's noticeably much more drinkable, much stronger stuff. So. So we're so we're ta- the 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 title of the episode is kettle fermentation, <laughs> and we've gotten right into that. <laughs> no, but uh, well, it, it, there there isn't much to kettle fermentation. <laughs> you know? I mean, you can basically sum it up as it works really well. Okay. So, what's your setup? I mean, well, first of all, how did you? Why, well, you, why and how did you come up with this idea? So I I've simplified a lot of things over the years. I don't go to a secondary. Um, I I go to a bucket. Uh, I then uh, use a saran wrap plug, you know, a plastic wrap to cover the top. And I use the uh, O-ring that's inside the lids and buckets. Mm-hmm. You can pull that sucker out. Works great. You put it over the top and it holds the plastic wrap tight. <laughs> So you 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 don't have a uh, airlock per se, but the plastic wrap will balloon up, and you can watch. You can look in; it's clear on the top. Uh, nothing gets in, and it'll inflate, and then it'll collapse when the fermentation's over. Huh? And I, and uh, I guess the uh, there's enough leaks in the seals so where it's not going to blow up. It just kind of releases yeah, I, as it goes. The, the plaster if I have is not wide enough to cover the whole thing, so I do two layers and then I just star sand the whole thing up. And yeah, it 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 eases out. When I got, if I've ever gotten worried, you can ease up on the rubber thing and it'll blow out. But it's you're under positive pressure the whole time, so nothing's right. nothing gets in. And I was I would have probably stuck with the buckets and the lid and the the um, bubbler, but I was having a hard time getting them to seal properly. Hmm. And and I wasn't getting activity in the airlock. And I was like, I can't see what's going on. And the thing's not bubbling. So do I have a gas leak on the lid or what? Um, so I just found this a lot easier. And plus you get to see it. So you know exactly what's going on, which is a positive. But, but um, even that's too much trouble for the... Even that was too much. <laughs> well, I, I started... Well, I thought, you know, plastic. I don't want to use plastic. So I, I should get some. I was going to get some. I've been looking at stainless steel fermenters and all kinds of stuff. And then someone's like, 
I don't know, Black Friday or something sale. And a uh, local homebrew store had these brew kettles, eight gallon brew kettles, and they were 30 bucks a piece. Wow. Uh, the only downside was they had a port in them. <laughs> it, it was like 60 bucks to get no ports. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't want a port in there. It's going to be like a bug zone. Um, but, you know, who can turn down that price? So, so I switched over to fermenting in the, the stainless kegs and then just sanitizing and cleaning and taking stuff apart. And it was kind of a pain. But it was nice that it was stainless and you, you knew you could really get it clean. Uh, and the those big O-ring things are even tighter on that because it's bigger around. Uh, so it made a really tight seal. And that's worked great. I mean, it makes such a tight seal that when you're draining out of the uh, tap, which is a nice thing, um, you have to actually punch holes in the plastic because mm. it'll stop. Huh. It won't let any air in, and, and you'll see it'll cave down, and then it just stops pouring. And you have to like punch some holes in it to let the to drain the rest off. Anyway, th- what I found was that the the ports were at just the right height, so that the yeast cake was just below it, even on a big beer, and so the valve was great. I could go right into the keg. Um, you have almost no oxygen exposure in this whole process. You've gone straight from the boil kettle into the fermentation tank and out from the bottom of the fermentation tank into the keg, cap it up and away you go. So that was pretty good. Um, and then I thought, well, since I'm using the same kettles to boil and ferment, why not just, I mean, if it's already cool, why, instead of transferring it over, why not just pitch the yeast and cover it up and go? And there you go. Um, and I tried it, and it worked really well. Uh, I was worried that with the big beer that the hop material and stuff would, would be too much, and I'd be getting a lot of junk off the bottom. But uh, at least for the beers I've done, that hasn't been a case. And about that same time is when you started the low gravity stuff and I started doing the low gravity. So when you're doing a 2% beer, you don't really have a whole lot of hop residue to worry about. Right. Um, and you can use the, the hop spiders and things like that if you're, you know, really have a problem. Sure. Now, uh, there's there, – some people might think you're just – what you're doing, you're just boiling the wort – Mm-hmm. And you are chilling it down, and you are pitching the yeast, and you're covering it up, right? Yep. So you don't. There's no process for removal of trube. Uh, right. You know, there's there's uh, you know people use whirlpools, and they you know make sure that the uh, the the trube uh, piles up in a uh, in a cone in the middle of the thing, and they rack, either rack away from it or they you know turn on the spigot and 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 bring take the wort away from the the kettle trube. You know, to go into well, the fermenter. And and when I was transferring to the fermenters, um, I'd gotten these bucket filters. I, I tried various things. I tried the whirlpooling, and I never really got very good at it. Uh, <laughs> even though I, I used, once I got a pump, which was another big boon, uh, it's, it's been great. Getting you know, the cam lock and a pump has been a real big help <laughs> and, and you get older uh as we are um <laughs> lifting seven gallons of liquid yeah uh sucks so if you have a pump you never have to lift anything again it's really nice um so i recirculate when i chill so it, it would have this spin and i would get some stuff in there and i did little arms to try and do things but i always got more stuff. So what I would do was when I pumped it to the fermenter, I'd run it through this, uh, I think it's a 300 mesh screen, which did two things. Uh, it aerated it mm. wonderfully. Um, and it caught all the gunk, but our friends over at, uh, Brewlosophy did a bunch of things on this and they sort of went, man, eh. Doesn't make that much difference, <laughs> <laughs> which happens a lot. <laughs> and, and I was like, "Wow, but doesn't make that much difference. Why am I doing it?" Um, yeah, for so, years. I mean, I, I, I'm one. 
where, uh, you know, back when I was doing extract beers, I would just pour the whole whole kettle contents into the bucket, you know, into the fermenter. Right. And then when I started doing all grain beers, you know, you get more uh, trube from all grain, or at least I do, for, than mm-hmm. extract because, you know, the extract – Manufacturers do, you know, protein break and they, you know, a right. lot of that stuff is taken out in the manufacturing process. So, again, I would wind up, you know, even even when I would uh, allow time for the wort to clear in the mm-hmm. kettle before I transferred, I would get down near the bottom and think, I got like a couple inches of wort. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it's cloudy. You know, there's stuff in it. Right. but. I don't want to waste that, and I would transfer it over anyway. So, <laughs> yeah, I always did that too. Yeah, that was. I mean, you're leaving a significant amount behind, but there was always it was never clear, clear when I stuck it in there. Yeah, and I tried various things. I had one of those hop, uh, one of those uh, uh, sucker filter things sits on the bottom. I made one of the things with just big screen in it, and it worked fine. Uh, I did a lot of stuff to try and keep the stuff out, and most of them worked, but they were a pain to clean. And it was a lot more stuff. And I hadn't, when I, for whatever reason, it failed or whether it ended up with a lot of troop and the stuff, I hadn't noticed a big problem. And it usually drops out pretty clear anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when they did their thing and it was like, no one could taste a difference. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> My laziness has been justified. I'm, I'm... <laughs> so I don't, you know, I'll, I'll, well, I mean, I mean, if I had to, but it didn't. I'm not worried about it. If you're in a professional situation where would, it's beneficial, you know, if you're going to be harvesting yeast later on from the from the you know bottom of a, a, a cylinder conical fermenter, yeah, you, you probably want to separate the protein, you know, and the hops, and you probably want to separate all that stuff out so that you're not harvesting a bunch of crap, you know, with your yeast. Right. But if you're a okay. home brewer, we're on cable. You can say crap. <laughs> that's as that's as dirty as I get. <laughs> so so I guess the bottom line is if if you are if you are thinking about fermenting in your kettle mm-hmm. uh and you're worried about, you know, exposure to trube over a long time, you can use hop bags or you can use a spider, you you can use something like that to, you know, take the hops out of the equation at least. You're still going right. to have to deal with the protein uh, break at the bottom and and such as that, but well, you can you could a lot of it sits on the top, right? You could scoop some of that stuff off if you really got worried about it. Um, uh, the, uh, the other little asterisk on this stuff is I'm not sure I would try this with uh, whole hops. I'd uh, stick them in a bag or something. Yeah, hop, um, I like. To call I have them a hop. whole bunch I grew in my backyard, but it, <laughs> I'll have to. I, I need like to, to do something. I like to call them something. hop sponges. Or wort sponges, whole hops yeah. or wort sponges. Um, so yeah, it's, mm-hmm. so is it, how do you? I mean, how do you aerate after you chill the? I mean, the process is is basically the same. You you boil and you chill, and then you got your wort in the kettle. Uh, how do you aerate? Well, I thought about that too, and I thought, oh man. <laughs> 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 um, so. Uh, the way I got to aerating is I have all these quick disconnects, right? With the, the cam locks. So I had one that I used to recirculate and spin the wort while it's cooling. And then I have another one that was just to hook over the, the bucket or kettle or whatever and spray it in. So it would spray it through the, uh, uh, filter or screen rather. Um, so I just switch over to that and run the pump and just, just you know, it's like a hard faucet spraying into the tank. I mm. run that for a while, and it gets a nice frothy head, and um, it's been fine. I yeah. mean, I th- I think again, that's... again, I don't know if it would work on, a, like, a commercial level. I, I think different dynamics happen when you've got 300 gallons of stuff in there, but... Well, uh, I, think, I think that that's one of the things that they did. Uh, Ken Grossman was talking about... Uh, the early days of Sierra Nevada, and uh, mm-hmm. one of the ways that they improved their beer was to, you know, basically make it go through a spray nozzle, 
you know, mm-hmm. going into the fermenter so that it gets aerated. You could also get, uh, if you want to get a little higher tech, and and the method that uh, everybody, you know, from Chris White uh, on down, you know, recommends, you know, you can get an aeration stone and an actual mm-hmm. oxygen tank Have and, them. and uh, <laughs> you know, do that. <laughs> yeah. I have them. I've done it. <laughs> I did it. Um, I did it for a while, and then I didn't – I ran out of oxygen on a batch, and I, I didn't go to the hardware store and, you know, get more, and then my beer came out all right. So uh, – <laughs> uh, that's pretty much exactly the uh, scenario that I had. I, I did a bunch of things. I had uh, I did a, the uh, aquarium pump with the filter, the, the you know, mm-hmm. I forget what they call them. That right. screens out all the bugs. Yeah. Um, and ran that in through the coarser stone. And I had the oxygen tank with the, the other thing. And in the end, I just never really noticed a difference. And it seemed like a whole lot of work for not a lot of benefit. Um, <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I don't I, have to. Do uh... I sound lazy enough? For what? <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's lazy, and then there's practical. Uh... <laughs> I mean, my my brew day is still six hours or so, but I'm get ten gallons out of it. Yeah, I'm not boiling my aeration stone, you know, to to sanitize it. That's one step that I don't have to do, you know. And I know, and I know that I technically I should, you know, but but uh, you know, my beers turn out pretty good. Well, the other thing with like all this pumping and things like that, the the plus side is I do run sanitizer and cleanser through after and all that kind of stuff. But you're circulating while it's boiling. Mm. So if you start the pump, you know, 15 minutes before the end, everything in the line is pasteurized yeah. before you start doing anything. And it's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you you want it all clean going in, but everything that's kind of touched the beer in that loop is going to be pasteurized before you're done. You don't want any ugly scum in there, but no bugs are going to survive. Uh, the only downside is that if you don't want to lift the thing of liquid, you're now stuck with your kettle on your burner. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for me, if I'm doing two batches, it doesn't make any difference because I'm not probably, but for like the summer party where I'm doing like four or six, whatever batches, um, then I'm going to have to do something. I'll probably go back to the old method and and move it over to the fermenter because I need, I don't want to (laughs) lift. And your gear is also tied up at that point. If you, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're not as fancy well, well, as... Well, I have, I, I have four kettles, so... I, have four, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, if you're not as fancy as you, <laughs> you, you have one kettle, and it's Yeah, if you want to do a up. bunch, it's, it's a lot cheaper to get buckets. <laughs> but, it's, but it's interesting, I mean, it's interesting to, to consider. Um, I mean, you know, it's one, one way to cut out a piece of gear, you know, theoretically... Mm-hmm. So what happens after the fermentation? You've got it covered up with the the plastic wrap, and and you're looked in, you look inside, and you know your fermentation's done. How do you move on from there? How do you package? Well, uh, while you're going, you can take uh, I have a refractometer with uh, uh, what's his face's spreadsheet. You're talking about Sean Terrell. Yes. Yes. <laughs> what's his face? What's his face? <laughs> I'm horrible with names. That's okay. Um, and I've never met him, so I wouldn't recognize his face either. But um, <laughs> he's a good guy. So if you, if you use that, you can. I, I don't own, I guess I do own a, a hydrometer somewhere, but I haven't used it in years. <laughs> I do everything with a refractometer. Once, once he had that thing published and, and a decently accurate. Uh, way to do gravity readings with a refractometer that was it i haven't gone back because again it's so easy it's quick so oh so uh so it's finished fermenting it's down there uh, oh so periodically i can you can open up the tap right because these have uh these have ports on them and i have valves on there and so you can take gravity readings while you go which is kind of nice mm-hmm. um i sanitize everything stick a silicon hose over the hose barb on the quick connect and stick it into an empty keg, open it up, go straight to the keg and force carb. So the, so the port is above the, the level of the, the, of the tube. 
Yeah, that as I said, that was my big worry. I was going to have to do some kind of weird arm to get it up and stuff. But uh, so far, it has been fine. I, I, you know, even the I started going into something just to see if it would get cloudy, and it wasn't cloudy at the beginning. So it's come out as clean or cleaner than the auto siphon, and I haven't had to use an auto siphon. Wow. So any down? Uh, I mean, any downsides other than tying up your gear? Uh, and you know, sitting on the on the burner, any downsides that uh, you can see? I I haven't found any. Um, the I maybe if you're doing a really big beer, you'd have more stuff. The last one I did, in there was a seven point two percent IPA, and you know that's got a fair amount of stuff in it, and and it was clear when it came out. So. Huh. Um, and my neighbor who drinks a lot of this stuff, I'm like, oh, this is the best one. <laughs> now, it's hard to say because I think any free beer is the best beer he's ever had. So, it's, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure that's a golden incitement. But, um, well, any it, it came out very tasty. It was very nice. So. Any time that you can avoid, you know, racking your beer from one place to another uh, after fermentation, especially. Uh, you're going to avoid oxidizing the beer and and picking up stray bugs and whatever else is floating around in your wherever you are. Mm-hmm. Well, Scott, it's been uh, it's been fun. Uh, I, I enjoy our, our emails back and forth. We we tend to have sort of the same rambling uh, uh, email exchange <laughs> that we. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. they're typing along and go like oh just a quick no that's like three pages okay. <laughs> <laughs> well i appreciate your coming on i appreciate uh, uh reconnecting audio wise and uh who knows i mean maybe maybe kettle fermentation will be the next big thing <laughs> yeah. it, it could be i mean this is to some extent it's kind of like the beer experiments there's no downside. So if it fits with your workflow, I think it's a great thing to do. I won't always be doing it because, as I said, when I'm doing more than two batches, I don't have anywhere to put right. <laughs> the other batches. Um, but it's nice to know, as a lot of the beer experiments, I, I wouldn't necessarily do the things, but it's nice to know that if, for whatever reason, you have to, it it's not going to be a waste, you know. You're, you're not going to destroy your beer. So I I appreciate it, Scott. It's good to talk okay. to you. Okay. Take care. Well, thanks again to Scott. I you know I can see where fermenting in the kettle would have some practical application in some situations, you know, space wise or, uh, you know, if you if you don't want to uh, invest in a bunch of fermenters or you know if it works for you. Give it a shot. It's always good to know of new techniques and to, uh, you know, sort of chip away at some established brewing practices, kind of brewing out of the box, so to speak. So thanks again to Scott. Always fun. Uh, I say always fun to talk to him. I've only talked to him a couple of times, but we, we correspond via email a bit. If uh, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to James at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low Tech Lagering, and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. You get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo. You can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store as well. You can find our log books where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all that out at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Flora Renew Probiotics, seven times stronger with 34.7 billion CFU. Well, CFU. Uh, 14 unique strains, and Acidophilus DDS1. I bet some kettle fermenting or kettle souring is going to be taking place. And Darn Tough Fred Tuttle Cushion Micro Crew Socks. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, 
Uh, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping, and we appreciate your support. And don't forget, you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. <laughs>